Well, hello, my name is Phil Wilfew, and it's great to be with you today from my study here in a, a reasonably sunny Bedford. And I get the opportunity just to share a few thoughts from the Word of God with you together today. And just to say, uh, I pray for you guys. I know I've not actually been to your church, but I hear from Dave Price uh, often the things that are going on in your church community. And just to say, I've been so inspired this year by your faith and by the stories of how you are serving the poor in your community, uh, the way that you're investing into the nations. And honestly, your faith is inspiring others. You may not realize it, but what you are doing uh, in your community actually has ripples out into the lives of many others. And I know hearing from Dave, for example, how you've supplied laptops uh, for those that needed access to kind of digital resources in this last season, that inspired us. And so we did a similar project and we ended up raising 10,000 uh, pounds to supply laptops in our community. And so I just want to say thank you for your faith in this season and for the way that it inspires others. And so Dave today has asked me just to share a few thoughts around what does an apostolic church actually look like? What does an apostolic church actually look like? And of course that word apostolic, it's nothing to be scared of. It's a long word, just like marmalade. And it's a Bible word. Apostolic is a word that we find in scripture. And it, it comes from a Greek word, apostelos, which literally means a sent one. Someone who's sent by someone to do something. And in scripture, we find people that are called apostles and they are sent by God with a particular assignment to do something. And so when we're thinking about this word apostolic, we're thinking, who is it that we're sent from and what is it that we're sent to do? And so we're gonna look at some of the apostolic characteristics in the Apostle Paul's life, because he's probably the preeminent example that we have of someone who was an apostle and did apostolic things in the early church and so we're going to turn to Romans chapter 15 where Paul talks about some of his priorities as an apostle and he begins to just articulate the things that he has been sent by the father to go and do in the world in which he lived and I'll suggest to you that these principles these apostolic principles give us a blueprint for how we should be building the church today and to say this is important for all of us but I would say it's particularly important for you as a church community because I believe you're called to be an apostolic community you have been sent by God to do something you have been given a specific assignment in the earth today and so I hope as we look at Romans 15 together you'll be inspired to the mission God has called you to so let's read together. We'll read a verse at a time and make some comments as we go through and look at five key characteristics of an apostolic church. And so we'll start in verse 14. This is Romans 15, verse 14. <clears throat> Paul says, I myself am convinced, my brothers and sisters, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with knowledge and competent to instruct one another. Let's just pause there. This is the first apostolic priority we see in Paul's life. He had a priority to produce healthy, multiplying disciples and churches. Here Paul is saying, listen, my goal, brothers and sisters, is that you are competent to instruct one another. You are filled with goodness, filled with knowledge, and you are able to instruct each other. And the idea here is from Paul that the churches and the believers that he was planting in communities were growing up as naturally multiplying disciples of Jesus. They were competent to replicate and to multiply into other people. And ultimately that is a fruit of apostolic ministry and apostolic churches is that we know how to make disciples. We know how to raise people that are competent to instruct other people and so on and so on and so on. And I really believe that in this season, God is speaking to us about moving out of the season of addition and into the season of multiplication. And I tell you, what we've been in in the past is not going to cut it for the future. We've got to move into an era of 
rapid, accelerated multiplication of disciples if we're going to see a nation changed. And Paul understood that. He wanted every believer with a multiplying DNA planted inside of them, that they weren't consumers, but they were multipliers. And so that's the first DNA we see in an apostolic church is that those kind of churches don't just come to sit in a pew and kind of fill some space. No, no, apostolic people are ready to multiply and to raise up others. And that's what healthy churches do, you know, and a little bit like parenting in a way. In parenting, it's really the art of doing yourself out of a job. And I know in some ways parenting never finishes. Parenting just changes with different seasons of our children's lives. But in a way, the goal, particularly in the early years of parenting, is to raise up competent, mature, young adults that are able to live life and be great people in society and contribute and make healthy relationships. That's the goal of parenting. It's not to hold on to our kids, but actually to release them to go and live life and to bear fruit for Christ. You know, this uh, last 18 months, my, my son, I've got two children, I've got a daughter who's about to leave home, and then I've got a son who left home about 18 months ago uh, when he was 19, and he's only moved down the road. Um, but, you know, it came to that moment as a parent where we recognised he was ready to leave home. And, you know, he's one of my closest friends. I love him to bits, but I could see in him, he was ready to move out and taste independence and live with some other folks from the church and just stretch his wings a bit. And uh, I, I tell you, it was, it was a great moment, but also such a painful moment to say goodbye to him from our family home. I mean, honestly, that I don't think I've cried as much in years when he left. Uh, we had our, our final evening together, we had a meal, we, we just kind of honoured him and celebrated him and then he had written a song for us, he's a musician, so he'd written a song um, kind of celebrating our relationship and I mean I'm, te I'm tearing up as I'm telling this story but you know it was a, a beautiful moment of actually recognising God has done something, we're thankful for our history but now is a moment where you are competent to go and live as a fruitful person in society. And ultimately, maturity is a fruit of good parenting. Maturity is a fruit of good parenting. And in apostolic churches, the goal is not just to build big churches, it's to build big people. I'll say that again. In God, the goal is not to build big churches, it's to build big people. Um, you know, God actually doesn't need a numerical advantages to change a nation. He just needs some big people who are willing to say yes with radical obedience. That's how God changes nations right throughout history. He just plucks people out who are willing just to give their whole heart to him and then nations change. That's how God does it. He's looking for big people on the inside. And I remember years ago chatting to a friend of mine, John Hosier, who was actually my pastor, my Bible teacher growing up as a teenager in Brighton and I remember once chatting to John and, and John said, listen, my main motivation for ministry can be summed up by what Paul says in Colossians 1.28. He says this, he is the one, Jesus is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with wisdom so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. And my friend, my mentor, my Bible teacher, John Hosey said, that is why I do what I do. It's to present people to Jesus fully mature in him. And that ultimately is the fruit of apostolic churches, is that we are raising big people who know who they are, who know who the Father is, who know that they're born to change the world, that are able to build healthy, fruitful, honouring relationships with other people. That's an apostolic church that has an environment for big people to grow up. And typically those are environments that aren't controlling, they're not domineering, um, they're, they're free environments where people have uh, an atmosphere that they can grow up in healthy and strong. You know, a uh, young guy who's in our church, in fact, he's not so young now. I, I, now, I say he's young because I saw him grow up as a student 
uh, in another church. Uh, but when lockdown first hit in, the, in that first March, uh, we cancelled our leaders weekend and most of us thought we've got a weekend off. You know, it was a novelty back then, <laughs> not so much now. But back then we kind of cancelled our leaders weekend. We suddenly all had free time. And my friend, instead of just using his free time to kind of surf Netflix, he prayed. He used the weekend to pray. And he asked God the question, God, what do you want me to do in this moment to serve the nation? And he felt God say, I want you to phone 30 church leader friends and ask them how you can help. And so he did. He spent the weekend making phone calls to church leaders from different streams and denominations saying, what do you think the church most needs in this moment of COVID crisis? And out of the back of those 30 conversations, he set up a charity that went on to serve over a thousand churches in our nation, fed thousands of people in our nation, helped those in poverty get out of poverty. And it was an organization called yourneighbor.com. And, you know, I loved seeing that because it was evidence of someone who'd grown up and was now someone big in Christ. And that is the fruit of apostolic ministry. Mighty oaks who naturally self-replicate. A second characteristic we see in this scripture is in verse 15, where Paul says, I have written to you quite boldly on some points to remind you of them again because of the grace God gave me to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles. And here's the second fruit of apostolic ministry is that we see these multiplied translocal ministry gifts operating with real authority. And Paul here says, listen, I was given grace by God to be a minister to the Gentiles. And grace can be used in two different ways in the New Testament. Sometimes it's used as undeserved favour, but sometimes it's used by supernatural empowering. And here Paul is saying, listen, the undeserved favour and the empowering work of God gave me a gift to be a minister to the Gentiles. And Paul is saying, listen, I, I am an apostle, not by choice, but by calling. God has given me something to do and I am living my life obedient to fulfil that calling. And ultimately, we believe that apostolic churches raise up those that are gifted to equip and minister to others. Sometimes these are referred to as the Ephesians 4 giftings. You find them in Ephesians 4 and verse 11, where it says, And God gave to the church apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers to equip God's people for works of service. And so these ministry gifts are given by God to prepare the body of Christ to be all that she can be in God. And you know, I'm convinced of this. If we are going to see a nation changed, if we're going to plant lots of churches, if we're going to see the gospel spread through the, the earth, we've got to see more Ephesians 4, 11 gifts raised up. We need more apostles, more prophets, more evangelists, more pastors, more teachers, men and women that are given grace by God to be minister ministers in those particular areas. Men and women who are gifted to equip and release and develop and to build other people. And the, the goal of those gifts is not that they are the ones that do all the ministry. Actually, they are called to be the ones that equip others for works of service. Uh, using prophets as an example, I often say prophets are like telephone engineers. And a prophet, you know, if he was a telephone engineer coming to your house to fix your telephone, you know, he would be a pretty poor engineer if he spent his whole time talking on your telephone. That's not his job. His job is to put the equipment in your house so that you can talk on your own telephone when he leaves. And that's really what a prophet is. It's someone who equips God's people to hear God. It's not that the prophet does all the talking or all the listening to God. He's the one that equips God's people for works of service. And we desperately need a multiplication of men and women who are called to be our prophets, apostles, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. And so I guess my challenge to you and your church is, are you being obedient to the call of God in your life? Are you living in obedience? You know, Paul was able to say to King Agrippa in Acts, I have not been disobedient to the vision from heaven. 
And at the end of my life, I want to be able to say to God, I was not disobedient to the vision from heaven that you gave me. Friends, what is it that God's saying to you and what are you going to do about it? Because that's what apostolic cultures look like. People who are ready to listen and obey and particularly live out of the calling that God has given them. And I would just encourage you, you know, copycat anointing is a very poor kind of anointing. If you compare your assignment with somebody else's, really you're going to miss it in life. You are actually called to run in your lane. You've been given a lane to run in. It's unique to you. It's unique to your gift type and personality type and opportunities and influences and experiences. And so I would just encourage you in this apostolic world that we're living in, be obedient to the vision from heaven that God has given you. Third thing, carrying on in Romans 15 and verse 17, Paul says, Therefore, I glory in Christ Jesus in my service to God. I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me in leading the Gentiles to obey God by what I have said and done, by the power of signs and wonders, through the power of the Spirit of God. So from Jerusalem all the way round to Illyricum, I have fully proclaimed the gospel of Christ. Here's the third characteristic of apostolic churches is that we see disciples and churches moving in the power of the Spirit in an increasing way. That's what Paul's saying here. And really, the most unequivocal description that we have of what an apostle does is an apostle moves in the power of signs and wonders and miracles. Um, Paul says it in 2 Corinthians 2.12. He says, the true marks of an apostle, signs, wonders and miracles were performed among you with great perseverance. It follows then that if apostles are marked out by signs and wonders and the power of the Spirit, apostolic cultures and churches should likewise be marked by the power of the Spirit in signs, wonders and miracles. And so apostolic cultures ask these kind of questions. How can we create a fireplace for the fire? You know, if you've got a fireplace in your home, I don't actually have a fireplace in my home anymore, but if you have a fireplace in your home, you want that to be a safe place for the fire. But if you are so concerned with safety that you never actually light a fire, how many of you know that you've made that thing redundant? The fireplace exists for the fire and not the other way around. And apostolic cultures are concerned with asking questions about sustainable power. How can we create atmospheres where the Holy Spirit is pleased to unpack his suitcase and stay for a very long time? How can we create spiritually healthy environments in which God is free to move? Environments of faith, environments of power, environments of openness to the person of the Holy Spirit. And ultimately, apostles build apostolic culture they build this kind of signs and wonders culture not through finely crafted websites but through demonstrations of the spirit's power and i would suggest to you that apostolic order without apostolic power is to be questioned in scripture apostles walked in the anointing they walked in the shadow of the spirit of god and it says of peter that even his shadow would heal the sick. Even handkerchiefs that touched him that were laid on the sick would make them well. There was such a power overshadowing the early apostles that signs and wonders happened almost effortlessly. You know, in many of the places in the world right now where the gospel is advancing quickest, actually people find Jesus to be their healer before they find him to be their savior. In other words, they see the goodness of God before they put their faith in following God. And there is nothing in scripture to suggest that this way of living our life has changed in the 2000 years since scripture was first 
written. We are called to imitate the model Jesus gave us, to go and proclaim the gospel of the kingdom, to proclaim good news for the poor, sight for the blind, that the lame would walk, that the eyes of the blind would be opened. This is still our good news message, to walk in the power of the Spirit. And I know that you guys are pushing in for this kind of stuff, and we are as well. And I've just been so encouraged in this last season, just seeing how even with all the restrictions and fear around health, still how God has been moving in signs and wonders and miracles. Uh, just this last week in our community, I was hearing of a, of a dad who was at the school gates, and his friend uh, had his uh, wrist uh, in a kind of bandage support, he prayed for his friend who called him the next day and said, you know, you prayed for me at the school gate. My wrist is completely better. This is a guy who's not a Christian, but suddenly he's had an encounter with the kingdom of God. Um, you know, I was in a, a, a Zoom call a few weeks ago with some friends in Zimbabwe, and we just prayed for a lady with asthma on the call. It was probably no more than 30 seconds worth of prayer, and instantly she was healed of her asthma. Uh, I remember being in a chat room this year, uh, just literally typing in the words, Jesus, may Jesus heal you right now, to a young girl who had a chronic dairy intolerance. And literally through the typed words of Jesus' name, the Spirit of God came on her and she was completely healed of a very serious dairy intolerance. And she is still healed to this day. She's chowing down on pizza and yogurt and milk and chocolate and just loving life. And, you know, the reality is, is that God is on the move still and he will be found by those who seek him for power. I think the provocation for us in this season in apostolic cultures is just to keep pressing in for more, to push past the disappointments, to push past the obstacles, to push through the mysteries and to keep believing God for breakthrough. Fourth characteristic, we find it in verse 20. Paul says, it's always been my ambition to preach the gospel where Christ was not known so that I would not be building on someone else's foundation. Rather, as it is written, those who are not told about him will see and those who have not heard will understand. This is why I have often been hindered from coming to you. Here's the fourth apostolic priority we see. It's churches and disciples who break new ground. And this was Paul's apostolic imperative is I want to preach the gospel where Jesus is not yet known. I want to break hard ground. I want to get the gospel into places where it's never got into before. And this is the heartbeat of apostles is that they are not so much concerned with the status quo. They want to pioneer into the future and to break new ground, to plant new churches, to start new businesses, to reach new people, to push the pioneers of where the kingdom of God can go. So my question for you is, where is God calling you to break new ground at the moment? Because apostolic churches will be asking that question all the time. You know, I remember going to uh, visit my friends in southern Russia for the first time, uh, maybe three or four years ago. And there's an apostolic family of churches that we went to serve in southern Russia. And as the team arrived and we began to get to know the guys there, we were just blown away by the, the ability to break new ground that they had and their passion to break new ground. And uh, we were working amongst a group of maybe 70 churches in southern Russia, working down into the Caucasus, into regions where it's uh, very, very difficult to preach the gospel. And uh, as we arrived, Valeri, who leads the apostolic team there, he had just got back from a church planting trip in Siberia, uh, which was seven days journey. I mean, not seven hours, seven days journey to get to the place where they were planting a church. In fact, to get to the, the village and town where he was preaching, you had to at one point get on a, on a, a kind of a, a ski kind of, what do you call it? A ski thing that goes along on the ice. And so he was going along the ice in Siberia on his kind of ski thing, preaching the gospel and then traveling back to be with us. And, uh, and then the day that our conference finished, Valeri got in his car and drove 10 hours through the night to preach the gospel in another town in southern Russia. And, you know, I, I was just blown away by this guy's heart to break new ground. 
And so from now on, if ever I start feeling a little bit self piteous or wanting to get too comfortable, I just say to myself, what would Valeri do? What would Valeri do? <laughs> because he had a passion to break new ground. You know, and I'd suggest to you that the great enemy of the church in this season is not conflict, but comfort. The thing that's going to probably stop us from fulfilling the call of God in our generation is the call to comfort, to live a comfortable but ultimately meaningless life. But in apostolic cultures, we actually say, I'm pushing aside the comfort. I'm going to find my comfort in the Holy Spirit, but I'm called to live a life of adventure and meaning and purpose. And so this is what apostolic cultures thrive in. And so what does it look like for you? What, what's new ground look like for you in this season? So many different ways we can break new ground. You know, it might be that God's calling you to reach a new people group. You know, some of you, maybe you're called to stay here in the UK for a certain amount of time, but then you're called to go. Maybe go to places where the gospel's never been heard. Maybe that's you. Again, remember a friend of mine, Joy, taking me to one side after a prayer meeting here in King's Arm, and we've been praying for Europe. And she said, um, Phil, it's great that we're praying for Europe. I love that. But please, can we pray for some unreached peoples? And she had a call to go and reach the Sahari people, who is a tribe of 250,000 people where there are no known believers on planet Earth today. They are a completely unreached tribe. And after that conversation, she left to move there, the other side of the world, to start learning the language and to start bringing people to Christ. Maybe it's an unreached people group that God's called you to. Or maybe it's a difficult place to be in. Maybe it's like a working class community or a, a place where it's difficult for the gospel to get in or it's dangerous for the gospel to get in. Again, my friend Paula, she moved from the King's Arms and she is currently living in one of the drug capitals of Mexico, right on the southern border of Mexico and the United States. And it's the place where so much of the illegal drug trade and prostitution um, uh, kind of flows between those two nations. And she is living in the red light district, reaching um, uh, street, street sleepers and sex workers. And she's, she's in a tough, tough environment where there's violence and gun crime and corruption and brutality. And yet she is living joyfully, meeting people and leading them to Christ. Maybe you're called to reach into some areas that are tough places to go. You know, maybe you're called to reach those that don't have resources in themselves. Maybe those who are stuck in cycles of poverty or mental illness or sickness. Remember my friend uh, Julian many years ago, uh, he was a successful marketing executive, uh, earning good money and uh, working in the city but God just began to wreck his heart for the poor. And I remember we would get together for coffee and he would just, he would process with me. He's like, Phil, I just can't get this call to the poor off my heart. I don't even know what I should be doing, but I just know God is ruining me and I'm weeping when I pray for the poor and I just don't know what to do. And, and in the end, I just had to say to him, Julian, you, you just got to go for it. God is calling you to, to a new thing and he will show you if you say yes to him. And so my friend bravely gave up his, his top marketing job and began to seek God for how he might serve the poor. And some 10 to 15 years after that decision, he has now set up one of the leading charities in our nation, working with asylum seekers and refugees in the United Kingdom. He has now got national influence because he took a de decision to pioneer and break new ground. Maybe that's you. Maybe you're called to reach people that no one else is serving right now. You know, globally there is plenty of space for pioneering. And in apostolic churches, we're always asking the question, where can I go and how can I break new ground? What does that look like for you? And then fifthly, we read in verse 23, Paul says, but now that there is no more place for me to work in these regions, and since I've been longing for many years to visit you, I plan to do so when I go to Spain. I hope to see you while passing through and that you will assist me on my journey there after I've enjoyed your company for a while. 
Now, however, I'm on my way to Jerusalem in the service of the Lord's people there for Macedonia and Achaia were pleased to make a contribution to the poor amongst the Lord's people in Jerusalem. And this is the last characteristic just to draw out today is that we see the emergence of apostolic centers that are able to resource the world. And Paul here says something quite remarkable. He says, listen, there is no more place for me to work where I am. And so I'm going to come to you in order that I might go on to Spain. Now, that's a remarkable claim because I'm pretty sure there were still lots of people Paul had never talked to about Jesus. And yet he says, my work is finished in those regions. There's no more place for me to work there. I need to go to regions beyond. What what was he talking about? Why did he say that? Well, I think it tells us something about Paul's heart to plant resource churches in a region that would then be able to reach that region for Christ. And as an apostle, once he'd planted a resource church in that region, he felt able to move on because his job was finished. His job wasn't to reach everyone, but it was to plant resource churches that would then be a resource for their regions and for their nations. And so for Paul, he's thinking, how can I plant the kind of churches that will resource many other churches? Naturally replicating, reproducing churches. And so for Paul, that was his heart. And again, apostolic churches are those that are called to resource other churches. They don't just exist for themselves, but actually everything that God gives them is for the purpose of sowing. And I'll suggest if you are called to be an apostolic church, you need to come to grips with the fact that God will give you things that are not just for yourselves. And that your decision whether to hoard or whether to sow will determine the nature of the blessing that comes your direction as a local church. Because ultimately, we sow today to reap later. Your decisions to sow today are going to reap a harvest in the future. And so apostolic churches are those that think, How can we give away every good thing that God has given us? I know for us as a church, one of the key prophetic motifs or pictures for our church has been of an aircraft carrier church. Now, aircraft carriers are these massive ships that are resource ships for invasion, but also receiving armaments. you know, these massive kind of platforms where planes come to land and planes take off. Often they're part of a huge flotilla of ships um, bringing kind of support and resource to a na- to a nation or an area. And we feel like that's what God's called us to, to be an aircraft carrier ship. You know, it's very different than a fishing vessel. They're both ships, but they both have two very different purposes. And, you know, you do get fishing boat churches that predominantly are just called to their locality to fish in their own waters. But then there are also churches that are called to be aircraft carrier ships that are called to resource, to give away, to live beyond just themselves. And I'm suggest to you that for you as a church, you're called to be an apostolic resource base, a church that sows the good things that God gives you. And as you keep making that decision to give away, give away, give away, God will keep adding to you and adding to you. He's called you to be a resource church. So here are some of the things that we see in an apostolic church in the New Testament. Five things. Number one, healthy, naturally multiplying disciples and churches. Big people. Number two, multiplied gifted men and women, translocal gifts that can equip other people, the raising up of apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers. Thirdly, churches and disciples that are moving in the power of the Spirit in signs and wonders. Fourthly, churches and disciples that are breaking new ground. What is God saying to you and what are you going to do about it? And then fifthly, the emergence of apostolic resource centers that can change the region around you. This is what we see in the New Testament. And I believe if we're going to see a nation change, then we need to see these kind of five characteristics in our local church communities to the glory of God. And I pray that as you listen to these words, you would feel that calling and inspiration of the Holy Spirit to live this kind of way, to live not necessarily a comfortable life, 
but to live a meaningful life, a life that brings change and transformation with the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Listen, thanks so much for listening to these words today. I encourage you maybe just read Romans 15 for yourself and just pray and meditate on these truths. But I just want to bless you in the name of Jesus. I bless your church. I bless your family. I bless the advance of the kingdom in your community. And I just pray that you would know exponential blessing as you push into Jesus in this season. I pray that signs and wonders would increase all around you. I pray that there'd be so many opportunities for kingdom advance. You'd hardly know what to do with them. And I pray that you would be shown unusual favor of open doors to influences where you are. I just bless you in the name of Jesus and wanna thank you for all that you're doing today. Amen.